Hello, everybody, and welcome to Udacity's uh, fireside chat as a School of Artificial Intelligence. Today, we're very fortunate to have Jorge Peñalba. Jorge is an innovator in, in artificial intelligence, in particular in the field of uh, natural language processing. He has uh, founded two companies, Centesis and Lang AI. And uh, well, hello, Jorge. We're happy to have you today. Yeah, thank you very much, Udacity, uh, for having me in this fireside chat. And yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. And for any students watching right now, uh, we invite you to ask any questions in our uh, YouTube page, and we're going to get through them later in the segment. So Jorge, tell us a little bit more about yourself and how is your journey towards, towards artificial intelligence, in particular towards, towards NLP? Yeah, so um, I'm an electrical engineer. I graduated in Spain, um, and then I took a master's in Chicago, uh, a master's in computer science. So the master thesis of my, of my master was focused on artificial intelligence and specifically in NLP. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I built a chatbot around Twitter conversations and I realized about like, the big opportunity in the field of NLP, how it was growing, but still how there was a lot of room for research and innovation. And that's what led me uh, to found uh, the companies along the way. So first, we started with a product, Synthesis, which basically uh, is focused on uh, Spanish-speaking conversations. We started the company in Spain, and we grew into Latin America, in Mexico, Colombia, Chile, um, with a product whose main, dif which the, the main differentiator in the product is basically uh, understanding uh, deep nuances in language in the different variations of Spanish, right? And along that way, uh, we realized about the opportunity uh, behind NLP uh, in terms of unsupervised AI. So we built Lang AI, which is a platform uh, where we apply unsupervised AI to understand any kind of unstructured text data. That's interesting. So let's let's dig more into that. Is we are students who have learned supervised learning and, and unsupervised learning, and, and the NLP we've seen so far is mostly supervised learning, right? So in the context of your work, uh, tell us a bit more about what is unsupervised learning in NLP and what are the differences. Right. Yeah. So so supervised learning, uh, as you probably know, um, is uh, focused on labeling uh, data, building a training data set, and then uh, the model learns uh, from that uh, training data. So in the field of NLP. A typical ex example is a spam classification. You label each email as spam or not, and the model is going to learn how to classify further emails into spam. Right? Um, so with unsupervised AI the, uh, or unsupervised machine learning, uh, the focus is on, OK, we only have the data, and we don't have any, any training data. We don't label the data. We have to group it in ways that make sense and can be useful. So the typical approaches are topic modeling, for example, with algorithms like mm -hmm. LDA or k-means. And in our sense, uh, what we do with Lang AI is uh, building those topics as intense or meaningful semantic contexts so that for our users, they can understand what's behind that data. Ah, interesting. So let's dig a little more into the details. What, what does a user bring to you? What data they give you? And what do you give them back? Right, so, so the, the goal of our platform is actually that we deal with any kind of unstructured data. So our user could upload into the platform open questions to surveys, social media data, call center data transcribed into text, uh, documents that are OCR'd into text, uh, any kind of unstructured text data, mm -hmm. and we're seeing many, many use cases. And once he uploads the, uh, the data set into the platform, the algorithm sta starts working and extracting those meaningful intents behind the data. And actually, that's something that is useful for a lot of our clients, where let's say you have all your call center history um, discovering what are the main insights in that data without someone having to label what topics you're looking for is very useful because it can allow you to understand uh, without being biased on, on a specific topics. Uh, but that's not like the end goal of the platform. So the end goal is with those intents, with those topics that we identify, we create language models to analyze further text data, right? So a client, uh, let's f follow on on the call center data example, a client would then send a call into the API um, and it would be classified along the topics that were identified initially, right? Allowing them to route the call or to be alerted if something critical is happening, whatever they, they need to do. Okay, and the new message will also train the system as well? 
the existing model? Yeah, I mean, the, the good point, uh, and that's one of the benefits uh, when for our unsupervised AI, is that uh, we can run it in batch as long as the user uh, keeps making calls into the API, and that allows to discover new intents and also to augment the previous ones, right? So okay. one, of the, um, one of the benefits of, th of that that we've seen is that uh, text data is very dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with uh, customer service data or customer conversations, uh, there may be new topics because there's a crisis, because mm -hmm. there's new ways uh, where we express ourselves. And that's one of the beneficial parts of unsupervised AI. And our algorithm is incremental in that sense. So it can discover and augment what ha has built initially. Oh, OK. So give me some examples of and some data and some intents that, that you work with. Then. Yeah, so uh, for us, uh, an intent uh, is we, we use a broader definition of what is usually used uh, in, the, in the industry, where an intent is uh, related to a chatbot, right? So the intent of the user, what they want to do. For us, an intent is more general. It's more like a semantic context behind the data, right? So we can have topic-related intents like customer service or online banking. We can have uh, product-related intents like uh, iPhone X or some other specific products. And we can also have like typical intents like pay bill. Right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm speaking about that banking example, of course. Um, and the reason is that what, what we're looking for is those semantic contexts that are meaningful and that may be useful uh, in some way. OK. Uh, so you mentioned augmenting data. That's something interesting, because we've seen, when I think of augmented data, I think of images. Maybe you, you flip them, you rotate them to get more images. In text, what, what is augmenting data? Right, that's a, that's a very good point. So um, one of the challenges that we deal uh, with uh, unsupervised uh, models uh, and on our side is that if the, if the text uh, that the client uploads doesn't have a lot of information, then there may be things that we're not able to detect, right? Because we're not using uh, label data, we're not using dictionaries, we're not using external information. So what we do is we augment the intents that we discover from the client data with external data in the internet, for example, right? So for example, one of the things we're doing is we're applying our unsupervised model into the Wikipedia to model uh, with our intents all the Wikipedia. So for example, if you have an intent which is um, I don't know, a mas business master, uh, but in your data you haven't seen, for example, the word degree, um, to, in order to augment that data, we can use Wikipedia, where probably master and degree have like the same context, mm -hmm. and augment the information that we have. Some right? kind of transfer learning. Yeah, exactly. Using. So okay. it's it's been done too with typical embeddings. Uh, Facebook has done something with mm -hmm. with their fast text embeddings. It's in a similar way, but applying our own our own algorithm into like external data. Oh, that's interesting. And you mentioned something about language agnostic, right? So this is all these models that you do are independent of the language. Yeah, exactly. So as our approach um, is a mathematical and based on information theory, um, we basically make it in a way that is language agnostic. So you only need the data to be tokenized, um, which is great because we are also able to serve a lot of the most underdeveloped languages. One of the mm -hmm. things with NLP is that there's a lot of resources for English, a lot of resources for the main languages, and there's a lot of languages in the world, right? So mm -hmm. we can deal with all the different languages by just uploading the data into the platform and discovering this semantic context. Ah, so training on English Wikipedia could help you serve a customer in Spanish or in French or in any language? Right, or even just with the data that the customer has, even if it's in uh, Filipino or if it's in Dutch, they just upload it into the platform and we're able to discover those semantic contexts automatically just out of the box. Oh, that's great. Uh, let's see. Um, um, so let's let's go deeper into the models. Let's say you, uh, without thinking about the scaling yet, what do you um, you know tell us a little bit about the the process that you do with the with the text and and how to cluster it and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, as as I was saying, we're applying uh, an information theory approach. So the goal is finding the semantic relations inside the data and finding which ones of those relations are meaningful enough in that specific corpora, right? So of course, the corpora has to be representative enough 
of the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. If you upload uh, 1,000 tweets, let's say, it may not be representative enough. But as long as it's representative enough, what we do is find those semantic contexts. And in order to uh, generalize them and not having like thousands of different contexts that may apply in that big corpora, we uh, build a generalization tree. And based on entropy and divergence measures, we can know uh, which intents contain information that is relevant enough for that specific use case, right? Mm -hmm. So somehow your own data is training the model without you having to do anything. Okay, and if a new, completely new language comes in, how much do you, do you have? It's, a, it's the same process, because like, the good thing is that the generalization tree can also generalize uh, tokens, right? So let's say I have something like, I don't know, fly in business, uh, like in business class, that could be an intent, and another one which is uh, flying uh, in business class too, right? Uh, if you don't have mm -hmm. lemmatization, right, uh, uh, the process of like extracting that, that mm -hmm. root in the word, um, then the technology doesn't know that fly and flying are the same. They're just yes. two different tokens. But as the context in where they're mentioned, this fly business and flying business is going to be the same, the generalization tree is going to be able to say, OK, this is actually the same intent, even if you don't have language-specific information, right? Just right. with the tokenized data. OK. Uh, and uh, let's say, well, we, we go from the models, and we have something very pretty, but you know, it's, it's hard to, to get it up to big scale. What, uh, tell us more about that process of turning your model into a, into a big scale model. Yeah, so um, I mean, the, the, the complexities we, we find in scaling, uh, there's two of them mainly. First one is when we're doing the setup process, uh, this uh, apl application of the unsupervised AI, we receive thousands or millions of texts. So what we do is we run the algorithm in a cluster uh, in any cloud provider, uh, so it could be AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, whatever it is. We run it in the cluster in order to discover this intent. So of course, uh, the complexities there, they're usually related to uh, CPU, but also to memory, because of we have to create matrices with all the embeddings that we extract from the data. So it's like a huge matrix that ha has to be held in memory. So there's complexities in terms of scaling the algorithm, of course. And then when you're running it in real time, it's mainly having an API that um, can have like a fast response time for clients. So when they have new data, they can analyze it in real time. Right? OK. How much um, percentage do you think is be between what you build in-house and what you use from technologies that are known? Yeah. So in our case, uh, almost 95% is proprietary technology. And the reason is that uh, our whole vision is that um, we have been focused on solving uh, NLP and language problems from the perspectives of, of humans. So humans are tagging data, humans are labeling data, or they're building uh, linguistic rules mm -hmm. uh, to work with the data. And we're trying to change that state of the art, right? So our vision is that the algorithms, the technology, should be able to think as a human in this unsupervised way and understand the semantics, right? When, when I'm speaking with you, you're not really doing the syntax analysis, right? You're not doing the lemmatization process. It's just uh, you're, you know the semantics behind that, and you're understanding what I say. That's what we're trying to build yeah. in our unsupervised AI concept. So a lot of what we do is building our own algorithms uh, that can apply to these problems. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that's our vision into the future. Too. Oh, great. So talk about vision into the future. I mean, I think one of the things I love about NLP is, is that it's still, you can see it's still in development, right? You can see that you translate something, is, it's not perfect, you know? And, and that's exciting, right? How do you see the, the state of NLP, for example? Like, how far are we from building, let's say, a fully functional chatbot? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the evolution of NLP in the past years uh, has been amazing. So when I, when I was doing my master's, uh, the word to back paper wasn't even out, right? Yeah. And it's been a whole revolution of how we use embeddings uh, run into supervised algorithms to, to reduce that mm -hmm. dimensionality of the data, right? Uh, so I, this is what I love about the field of NLP, and it's that there's still a lot of innovation 
uh, that can happen in the space and that is happening. And in terms of the of the chatbot, with, with which of course is one of the um, applications that are more uh, talked about these days, um, I think there's uh, still a lot of complexities to solve, right? So uh, there's chatbots that are working pretty well in like a specific industry problems. So you can build a chatbot to uh, reply automatically to problems that a bank user can have, right? And it can mm -hmm. be paying a bill or having a problem with his account. Like it's limited to a, to a limited amount of problems, right? But then when you go a little bit more open, uh, you want a chatbot that can empathize with the user. Uh, mm -hmm. You want a chatbot that is able to respond to uh, different uh, questions that they may have. And that's where we find the complexity of how we build that without someone having to tag and level data, which yeah. goes into the Absolutely. scaling problem again. So if for every chatbot there has to be someone training it, then it's not going to scale because like as humans we can talk about anything yeah and hopefully in the same way that we that a, a neural network can learn from sorry for example some images of trucks and then it helps us when you're going to recognize birds i mean hopefully maybe the bank chatbot will be able to help you you know have a chatbot for a different domain right yeah no no of course and, and goes in that direction yeah of course and, and that could apply to uh to languages so part of the research for example that we're yeah. doing in languages is, OK, we apply the algorithm in different languages. But let's say a client in Canada, for example. Yeah. They have French and they have English. Yeah. So apart from discovering those different intents or topics, they want to match them, right? They want to see that customer service in English and customer service in French are the same. So we, we of course, have to look at those transfer learning approaches or those similar applications that can be built for right, right. many, many Correct. different clients or languages. Right? Yeah, in the same way that when you're an adult, you learn a second language, but you already know a bunch of stuff in your first language, so you need to relearn all that. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's that's what we're trying to build. Interesting, yeah. So um, where do you see the innovation on NLP? Like, how, do you think we should focus on coming up with uh, better algorithms or on um, implementing them or on scaling the simpler ones? How much do you see the, for somebody who coming into NLP, like what, what, what do you think the fo future focuses on? Like? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, for me also as, as uh, being six years innovating in the NLP space and trying to think about products and applications that ha can help people, uh, I mean, clients or anyone who's trying to build a product uh, in that in that path, uh, I think my 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 take is that uh, as I was saying before, there's still a lot of innovation to be made, right? So uh, my advice would be uh, learn the basics, learn the core, learn the math behind the algorithms, and try to build something that is different. Because mm -hmm. these days, anyone uh, or anyone with like basic knowledge, uh, programming or engineering knowledge can apply uh, TensorFlow uh, to solve a specific problem. And mm -hmm. there's thousands of articles out there explaining how to do it. But um, I think our goal and the goal of everyone should be, for this specific problem, how do we think of something different that doesn't have to be built by Google or Microsoft or AWS, mm -hmm. but also other people that are innovating in the space? OK. So let's go there. Let's say you, you start a company in NLP, you're competing with big big providers at like Amazon, IBM, Google. How do you how do you enter that space and how do you you survive and compete in that space? What are yeah, that's a that's a very good question. So I mean, um, I think the main advice would be having some sort of focus. Of course, it's difficult to compete in everything because they have a huge research team. Uh, mm -hmm. They're uh, building the state-of-the-art algorithms. For us, the focus is unsupervised AI and how we apply this in a platform mm -hmm. that solves a very specific problem. But this can be also done in a more vertical way. So if you're building the solution that is going to uh, understand all the conversation, uh, for example, uh, behind a specific vertical, that's something where you're going to have an edge because you're already going to have the clients. You're going to keep building the model that is going to learn from all the clients. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something which is going to be an advantage, right? So my 
my advice would be uh, focus, focusing on something that is going to allow you to have an edge. And I believe that uh, although a lot of the research is now coming from the big players, the big players can also change, right? And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to enable the next generation of NLP products through unsupervised AI. So of we're actually course. opening our platform, our API, so that developers can also build products on top of our platform. That is great, yeah. Um, so let's see, you know your space, you know your products, you know the algorithms, you know how to scale it. How do you build the company? How do you build a team? How do, how do you, a data science team? Or yeah, yeah, no, um, that's, uh, that's a good point. So one of the things with a startup would, where I think it's different uh, as opposed to a big company, is that uh, in terms of data science, uh, you need to have a long-term vision, right? When you're researching, things are not like new algorithms, new um, solutions are not going to be done in a month or in days. So you need to have that long-term vision, but also thinking that in the short term, you need to have either clients or some so sort of financing because someone believes in your vision. Mm -hmm. So building that data science team needs to have that in mind. How to keep the research focus while at the same time knowing that you need to build a product that users or clients are using and are uh, benefiting from it. Mm -hmm. And how do you... Um like you're doing research, you're pushing the boundaries, but at the same time, you need to have a product that is working, and that's uh, that's not easy, right? How do you balance those two? Yeah. So what we try to do is, in our organization, we try to be very horizontal, so that all the teams are working together. So the data science team, backend, frontend, uh, designer, UX, they're all working together, and the loop is closed in a faster way, right? So you, the the, the first uh, step in the chain, of course, is the research. Well, the first is the vision, right? What you want to build, mm -hmm. what can be beneficial for clients. Then researching along that area, but always with the focus of, okay, what is this going to mean in terms of the product and why is it going to be beneficial? The good thing is that if you use that feedback and those teams communicate uh, um, in an efficient and, as I was saying, horizontal way, then things can be changed pretty fast, right? I mean, it's difficult to build an algorithm from scratch, mm. but then making the modifications can be fast. So if you're getting the product feedback, then you can modify the algorithm to adapt it to your users. And that's what, what we try to do in our organization, uh, like ma making it uh, fast to move with the product feedback. Okay. Yeah, something I find interesting in artificial intelligence is one field that you have to have always a working product while you do better. At places where you're building an airplane, it, it's, not, it's not flying until it's finished. But in here, it has to work since the very beginning. Yeah, right? no, totally. And, and especially uh, in the way we've built our products and our companies, it's been uh, mostly working with clients, working with users, right? I mean, there's probably uh, research centers or bigger companies that can even have like a longer term vision mm -hmm. uh, where they're sustained by external resources to focus on some kind of research. In our, uh, in our case, it hasn't been like that. And I like it because you have feedback from day one. So mm -hmm. you know what's going to work, what's yes, not going to exactly. work, you and based on the user. You use the, you use the input from the users as a part to... Exactly. To and you can even use it sometimes if you build like the right product you can even use it to feed it directly into the algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of feedback. Like a meta thing because yeah. you're using the error, uh, the, the feedback to, to keep training your own, yeah. your own company yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to yeah, bring yeah. this answer. Exactly. Cool. So what is the perfect data scientist that you would hire? What is, what is your ideal of, uh, of, of what you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, in our, on our side, uh, we differentiate between like two different kind of profiles. Uh, the senior one where we're looking for uh, someone that, as I was saying at the beginning, can think outside of the box and basically build their own models to solve a problem. So not just applying some algorithm, but building something that is going to work from our use case. Because we're solving use cases that are unique to us, mm -hmm. so we need someone that can build that model, right? So it's usually in that senior side, it's usually a PhD or someone that really understands those algorithms. Um, and on the other side, we also uh, like to have like 
more junior people on the team uh, that can actually benefit from being in that senior team, from working with people with a lot of experience, and they can start uh, applying those uh, algorithms, but also we can train them or educate them on how to, in the future, be able to build their own models or apply their own models, right? So we have that guidance from the senior people to feed into the, into the more junior people. Okay, so most of being able to, to build your own models and, and think yeah, about Yeah, that's, that's what we're looking for in our specific case, because as I was saying before, we're trying to change the state of the art and like have a different vision of like the typical supervised models that are applied to NLP. So we are like applying that to building chatbots, which of course you have the complexity of how you find the object and an action in a text without someone tagging mm -hmm. what's, what is an object and, and an action, and even without knowing what is a verb and a noun, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the complexities that we encounter that probably a lot of people don't. So we need to solve that thinking with our specific mindset. So for example, you think of, do you think of unsupervised learning as a way to do supervised learning, like a way to tag things? That's a, pr that's a primary method or a thing in itself? I mean, uh, um, we apply unsupervised learning in both ways. So itself, it allows users to discover in a very quick way what's behind their data sets. But our goal is that we build the language models behind those specific intents so that mm -hmm. they can classify further data that they have. So it's really like self-supervised in a way. Okay. Um, and that's, that's how, we're, how we're trying to build all our, all our context to solve like the full end-to-end -end problem uh, that they're encountering. Okay, and what's sort of like the next thing in your radar? Like, what is the next thing you wanna you wanna solve? Yeah, so so the kind of problems that we are solving um, are focused, as I was saying before, on this end-to-end -end problem, right? So, for example, we have research on the correction side. We get a lot of noise in text, especially when it's transcribed from calls. Mm -hmm. When it's from social media, you get a lot of, a lot of orthographic errors. Mm -hmm. When it's documents and it's OCR, you get a lo lot of errors too. So we're building correction models, actually using, in that case, bidirectional networks. Um, uh, and we're researching in that field. Other fields is how we understand deeply what someone wants to say, what people want to say in order to build a chatbot. So this object action that I was uh, saying before mm -hmm. and how in an unsupervised way we can also build the response automatically, right? Mm -hmm. Without someone having to tag or look for entities that you're yeah. looking for. How can we do that in an unsupervised way, which is kind of a, a big line of research for us. Another one is related to combining different languages, as I was saying before, mm -hmm. not just being able to make the technology language agnostic, but being able to match um, intents in different languages. And into the future, a specific research for uh, the complexities you encounter with different kinds of data. So it's different if you're dealing with a document, of which course. has like a lot of paragraphs with information in each of the paragraphs. Uh, whereas uh, when you're dealing with Twitter data, it's short yeah. data with like usually one or two intents, right? Yeah. So adapting the technology to work better for each of the use cases. Great. So we have a question from Claudio Toledo. He says, as a data scientist or machine learning engineer, how much math would we use on a daily basis in Lang AI? And how does that compare to how much intuition is used? That's a pretty good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So. In our case, uh, math is very relevant in order to build the algorithms because, as I was saying, we're not applying. We're building our own algorithms. So mm -hmm. knowing all the math concepts that are going to allow you to find like the best distance when you're measuring distance between intense or mm -hmm. between semantic context or like the, be the best uh, way of making the algorithm more efficient, that's gonna be that's gonna be math, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, there's also intuition and understanding what the industry is demanding, and that's why also uh, we try to be very open with communication of what is the use of our product, what our clients are demanding, so that everyone in the team can have that intuition, which we call innovation, which mm -hmm. is one of our values in the company, mm -hmm. on how it's not only applying things that. I decide or the head of NLP decides or mm -hmm. the CDO decides, it's everyone can propose new ways 
of solving problems that we encounter uh, along the okay. way. And how have you developed that intuition yourself or, or people around you? Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> a good point. <laughs> I, guess, I guess, yeah, I mean, being, being in, the, in the industry uh, for six years, I've always tried to communicate a lot with clients or potential mm -hmm. clients and uh, actually with everyone. Like whenever uh, there's people I can meet that are in the field of NLP, mm -hmm. it's positive and beneficial for me because they can open my mind into different problems. And I yes. think that's how you train that kind of intuition, getting a lot of feedback from everyone and mm -hmm. then being able to synthesize that and understand what's the next need, what's the next thing that the industry is going to need. Uh -huh. And let me follow up on Claudia's question. What, uh, aside from math, what, what kind of technical uh, abilities some, should someone have to um, work in Lang AI? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, knowing how to program. So in our case, we use, we use Python. Mm -hmm. um, so having the basics of programming is important because we, in our case, the data science team, they build the models, they have to make them somehow efficient, and then uh, there's a team that brings them into, into production, but you need to know how to program. It's not just thinking in those models, yeah. of course. So having that base is also important, because from the first moment that you're building the algorithm, it's good that you think in how to make it more efficient. And the thing is that we're a startup, so the more efficient it, it is, the less we play, we pay to AWS or whatever of it course, is, right? Of course. So that's yeah, important those matter. too. Um, and then, yeah, uh, engineering knowledge. And for me, it's like knowing the core of how things work. So understanding okay. how algorithm works, uh, how algorithms work, uh, and not just applying them. I think it's very, very important. That's good. Yeah, yeah we focus on that a lot. And actually, I think if it is a, it's a car, like you can drive a car by just knowing knowing how the car works and that's it. But if you want to drive the fastest car, like a Formula One or something, you need to know how everything works, right? So I'm guessing it's the same thing in Yeah, same in thing. If you, you want to If you want to tweak your car, then you need to know how you it works how to it works. change the piece. And, and same thing with, with these algorithms. There's probably someone that has done something similar, but you need to think, OK, I, this approach is nice or it's interesting. How does this apply to my problem? And how can I think of a similar approach mm -hmm. for this to be solved? OK, great. So let's say uh, you've, you've had a lot of experience. You've learned a lot. Let's say the younger version of you comes in, a little Jorge say, comes in. And what, what advice would you give him to, to get into the space? Yeah, I mean, in, in my case, uh, I guess it's an interesting case because I just uh, after my master's, uh, I decided to build a company. Um, so I mean, I think the, the good way of getting into the space so, I mean, the, the good thing of getting into the space so young is that uh, I've been able to travel, I've been able mm -hmm. to build a company in Mexico, now in the US uh, in my early days, which is, which is mm -hmm. great. I've been, I've been learning a lot mm -hmm. of product, business development, uh, technology, etc. So, I mean, my advice on, on the student side would be, uh, I mean, building upon the, the, the same concept before, Learn as much as you can of how things work and learn on how to think outside of the box, what people are looking for, what products can be built that solve a problem. And it doesn't have to be like a huge problem. It can be a small problem that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, you can build a very good NLP model and, and, and build a great company, right? In okay. our case, our first company it was a problem with the Spanish language. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, there, there wasn't a lot of resources for that. And we built this company where we now have clients in five different countries, a lot of uh, people using our technology uh, to, un to better understand the Spanish language. Uh -huh. So actually, you, yeah, so your, your, your first language is Spanish, so, so is mine. So we both have English as our second language. And uh, I'm wondering if, if you've seen that uh, as, as a challenge or, or as a benefit, both entering AI and entering particular NLP, which deals with language, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the, the benefit now, and, and especially with education platforms like Udacity, is that the world is global, right? So mm -hmm. you can learn AI from the biggest experts in the world from uh, wherever you are. Um, and you can actually build those AI or NLP models from wherever you are. So what you are. So I think that's a benefit from 
for all of us in, in the world that we that we live in. Um, and I think that's that's something that we should take advantage of, right? So, for example, uh, there's uh, our team, our technology team is in Spain. Uh, there's a lot of talent in Spain. It's an amazing city, and we built it there. And I'm now I moved uh, uh, to the U.S. Uh, six months ago for our launch here in North America. Um, and it's amazing too how uh, we can communicate between the team without me having to be traveling all the time, yeah. right? So, so the the world is global now, um, and I think that's something that that is beneficial in terms of AI and NLP too. Okay, yeah, we have many students who live in different places or whose language is different. And so, what would you say? Uh, any words of advice on on how to get into the space? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's that's uh, and, and replying also to the, to the previous question. I think that's that's uh, an advantage in the in the sense that. Um, NLP, most of NLP resources are for English still. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do uh, NLP work in your own language, uh, you're going to have to deal with the base problems, right? You're probably going to have to adapt the lemmatizer to make mm -hmm. it work better. You're probably going to have to build some resources of your own. Like in, in the initial days, we had to build like our own uh, sentiment uh, ontology, for example, yeah. because there wasn't a lot of resources in Spanish. Same can happen in a lot of languages. So that's a benefit in the sense that it's going to help you learn all of the NLP problems and how actually you build them from scratch. And I think that's yeah. beneficial because it's, it's good to know, uh, as I was saying before, how things are built. Yeah. And then you can apply resources that are out there. You need to build your own. Uh, but it's it's good to okay. to have to be open minded on how uh, different languages and NLP can be applied into different languages. Yeah, yeah. And when it comes to learning things, like do you have a, a particular way of, of learning something new? Because AI is always about learning more, right? Like we don't really it's not built yet, so we have to constantly learn. How, what is your way of learning? Yeah, that's a that's a good point too. So I mean, in in my sense, it's not only AI, right? Because uh, I have to learn about uh, product development, business development, technology. So there's there's a lot of topics. Um, and what I do is I try to follow the leaders in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of technology, I try to follow uh, the newest recent uh, research papers um, and try to read them, try to understand them, try to know where things are going, even if mm -hmm. I don't dedicate the time to build the models myself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually something that we also do in the team. So we do these sessions where someone in the team uh, finds an interesting paper and they present it uh, mm -hmm. to the rest of the team so that's that fantastic. we can all understand why it's interesting. I think having that in mind, being able to be uh, in the forefront of research um, from all organizations, yeah. from all researchers in the world, I think it's important. Yeah, and having fun, right? I think yeah, it's it's yeah. yeah, it's totally it's it's enjoy, fun. There's there's going. like like we have new fields like fact checking, right? It's it's become very big now needed. and very recent, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where we all know it's gonna be an important problem. But ten years ago, yeah. we didn't have this fact checking exactly. problem. Right? It's a new yeah. NLP problem yeah. that has come along the way, and people are trying to build uh, solutions yeah. to that. So. It's exciting that all of us are learning at the same time, right? Like it's, not, yeah. it's not some teachers I'm learning. I actually feel like I'm learning as well. <laughs> yeah, me too. There's a follow-up question from Claudio again. Uh, do you worry about the ethical implications of AI, like the consequences of mistakes and biases in your data and algorithms? Yeah, no, totally. We, we, we worry about that. And that's usually a problem that we've seen with uh, images, right, uh, where it can be biased. Uh, to some regs or some yeah. uh, specific problems that can happen. Um, in the case of text, it can be similar in a way if you have models that are a black box, right? Mm -hmm. And that's actually why we believe um, that what we're doing with this unsupervised AI can be useful. So the technology extracts the intents, and you can you have a name for the intents. You can click on them. You can see what is behind one specific intent, mm -hmm. and you can understand what's the data that is that is running. You can you can get a feeling of that, right? Whereas maybe sometimes where you're using a neural network, maybe you don't know what's happening, you don't know. Uh, yeah. which can be 
which can be problematic. And I think uh, it's something that the industry as a whole has to pay attention on how to make models less of a black box yeah, and more open so that we can also tweak them uh, to, to make them like less biased into, yeah. into the ethical problems that That's we can true. encounter. No, and this is not just, as you say, it's not just the, the, the data, but also the model, right? Like I feel like I used to work in recommender systems and I think I couldn't get away of recommending things to myself. Like I was just thinking of how to do it. You know, the user was always a, a version of me and I think in that way, Diversity, as you mentioned, is very is very important, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. and, and it, it leads us to the to what I was talking before. If in the terms of NLP, if someone is gonna be training the model and labeling data, it's gonna be biased to their criteria. Yeah. So let's say uh, in the typical example of sentiment analysis. Okay, I'm labeling some data. Let's say I'm a negative person. <laughs> then everything is going to be biased <laughs> into negative, right? Yeah. And this could happen into any kind of personality. So the personality behind the NLP is going to be the user's personality that is tagging that data. That's yeah. what we're trying to, to avoid. Yeah. How much do you think we just have to become less biased people and how much do you think we have to have better models? Like, do you think it's a trade? Yeah, probably, probably it's both. Yeah, probably a model if you use different, like a representative set of people tagging data a model should be able to overcome that hopefully. bias, hopefully. Uh, but uh, can we do that? And uh, I think specifically, can we know when the algorithm is biased? I think that's the yeah. important thing too, like realizing it Finding can be biased, right? Because if you don't even notice, then you're just applying the algorithm, it's like solving some problem, and it's maybe biased to some raci racist problem or a gender equality problem because you didn't think of that uh, underrepresented uh, Absolutely. minority. Absolutely, yeah. It's a problem. Definitely, yeah. So, yeah, like um, you as, as me, as many people, uh, most people watching, we, d we didn't start in, in AI, right? We started somewhere else and so there's no major yet in AI. Um, in terms of your journey, like was there, was there a moment where you thought a pivotal moment that you're like, okay, I'm, I'm in this thing? Yeah, so um, I think as uh, most of the students, when I was younger, I didn't have any idea of what I wanted to do. So when I was choosing my degree, I was That's between right. physics, math, uh, electrical engineering, uh, well, kind of everything mm -hmm. related to, I mean, I knew I wanted to do some science major, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So, so yeah, I mean, there was one professor specifically uh, uh, that showed me that electrical engineering could combine many different fields, uh, like electrical and computer mm -hmm. could combine many different fields and then I could yeah. decide, which was beneficial for me. And then when I was in Chicago, uh, there was this uh, professor, uh, Professor Argamon uh, in, in the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, that uh, he actually recommended that I went into the field of NLP to do my mm -hmm. thesis. Um, and I think it was a great, great step in, in my career because, uh, like, uh, of course, it, it wasn't as big a, a, as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's important, having some kind of guidance, having some kind of senior people um, mm -hmm. that can guide you uh, through the process where you're gonna, where you, when you're going to go into AI because they have the experience and maybe they have the vision at yeah. the moment where you're starting in AI, you may not have, right? Yeah, now, yeah. after you work some years, yeah, you can yeah. be that person, but at the beginning, you need some guidance. Okay, so who has been influential people that you can, that you have looked up to? Yeah, no, I yeah. think, um, I mean, for me, in, st in, t in terms of that research, uh, those two professors I mentioned have been influential to me. I guess uh, when I think of it too, I ended in the, uh, linguistic or NLP space and uh, my mother uh, is a Spanish teacher oh, yeah. uh, so so she understands or somehow focuses on understanding linguistics right which, mm -hmm. is, which is interesting and my father is a scientist uh, in a totally different space mm -hmm. but I guess I kind of uh, maybe looking up into them I uh, have tried to combine those two fields into NLP which is one of the things I love about NLP like uh, you get to combine uh, that uh, linguistic way of thinking where you need to know 
about language, you need to know about humanities, you need to know about emotions around people, but also yeah. you have this algorithm and AI focused machine learning focused approach uh, with the technical side. Yeah, it certainly combines that because language really captures a, a lot of you know, human emotions and a lot of what we really are, right? Exactly, and, and it's, I think it's the, one of the biggest challenges that, that NLP faces too and that chatbot faces too, how to, how to make them more human. And are we gonna be able to do that, right? Are we gonna mm -hmm. be able to make a chatbot um, somehow empathize with, uh, with the user and understanding what the user is really feeling, the problem that he has. Because for example, in a, in a customer service center or uh, for complaint management, a user can be angry. Uh, and if you're not really getting the feel of that as a good customer service agent would do, you can encounter a problem, right? So that's where emotions or psychology are also very, very important into NLP. Yeah. Are there other fields in AI that you think can also can also capture what what we are, um, or other fields that you're interested in? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think most of the of the fields in AI, what they're trying to do is solve a problem that uh, someone was doing before in a more human way, right? So you can be mm -hmm. looking at an image, or you can be looking at text, and you are gonna understand what that image is about what text is about or automating other kind of processes. So I think that that happens in, in, in the whole AI industry and it's one of the, of the challenges as an, as an industry too, like how do we make this, this AI more, more human? Right, yeah, I guess if you wanna make, you know, humans have language but we also see, we also like it, com combining all these things. Yeah, 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 how, how do we, yeah, like, yeah, when we see something also, an, an image uh, of someone, we can also understand if he's sad, maybe capture his emotion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of research in that field too of yeah. how do we really understand their emotions. And I actually was seeing this, this example of uh, the other day, this example of real time emotions in Mark Zuckerberg in the, in the Congress oh. the other day, which was <laughs> That's interesting, pretty interesting yeah. like how it was like yeah. angry or not or worried yeah. or like, like and it's, yeah. uh, that's, that's interesting how we can really understand what he's thinking because also yeah. every personality can be different, right? I can just yeah. have a poker face and you can think yeah. angry. <laughs> but maybe the computer has seen enough that <laughs> yeah. it can tell poker face or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The company uh, Affectiva, if you worked for, for the computer vision nano degree and they, they used to do that, like they would analyze like human emotion faces yeah. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe it's, that's, that's the one I saw. Cool, yeah. So our question from Chris actually, what unique challenges does natural processing, uh, natural language processing compared to other fields like computer vision? I mean, I think uh, one of the unique problems of NLP is how uh, sparse uh, the data is usually and how many features you can feed into the algorithm, right? Mm -hmm. So initially, of course, typical initial NLP papers, uh, for example, in sentiment analysis, they would use a bag of words model, mm -hmm. right? And the challenge is that, okay, you feed all of the words into the model and there's a lot of features. So, uh, of course, there can be a sparsity problem. Mm -hmm. uh, along the way, we work with embeddings to reduce that kind of dimensionality and somehow put together things that are similar and feed that into, into supervised algorithms. And I think that's the the main challenge in language that we may not find in other problems, um, how we find the right features and the right features that are relevant, mm -hmm. which is where like mainly all of the problems focus on that, right? Like right. how do you find the top words for a certain right. problem? How do you find things that are synonyms? How do you find things that are related? Mm -hmm. How do you lemmatize data in order to, to like reduce the dimensionality? And that's, that's, I think, the, the, the beauty of language, the variety of it. And that's only in one language. If we go yeah. into all of the languages, then maybe one thing doesn't translate exactly into another language. Yeah. So in translation, you're going to find that problem. It's not direct translation. Yeah. It's a different expression. Well, things like humor or things like a person and I are different in different languages. Have you, have you tried translating a joke to a different language and seeing that it's not funny at all? 
Exactly. And that's probably a challenge yeah, that happens yeah, yeah. as well in, yeah, in exactly. models, right? So, so that's, that's I think, the, the beauty of, of language and the beauty of having so many languages in the, in the world is that we have to deal with that diversity yep. uh, in, in, in all mm -hmm. languages. Yep. Another question, do you find applications for traditional symbolic AI techniques as part of the models and systems you build for modern LP applications? Or in other words, how much of this is traditional AI techniques and how much is it is like deep learning approaches, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's uh, what I was saying before, um, that I think understanding the core, uh, the, the core of algorithms and the math behind it is very important because uh, a lot of the people are applying deep learning, they're mm -hmm. building these complex neural networks to solve NLP problems, but those neural networks are already in TensorFlow, anyone can do it, right? Yeah. So I think that's very important, that kind of uh, different way of thinking where everything you've learned before uh, that applies to different algorithms you can apply it to a certain problem that you're encountering. Mm -hmm. And this is specifically what we're doing. Like we're using uh, uh, information theory, we're using entropy measures, we're using divergence, mm -hmm. and kind of information gained behind the data that we that we deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that has been there. It's not new, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, that's a great thing about research uh, and about thinking differently Deep learning can solve a lot of problems. It's amazing, amazing breakthroughs. Same with embeddings. Embeddings yeah. were a great breakthrough. But like, let's think of other research fields or research uh, vision that can be as, uh, as a breakthrough as War to Beck or Glove were or now deep learning. Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, and I'm guessing it's also like in a, as a learning process, right? Like just how you would tell yourself years ago to learn math basic math and, and computer science, like right now, I would tell you know, people to say, well, learn, don't just learn deep learning, that's very important, but also learn all the traditional algorithms and how they work. Yeah, you know, I remember when I, was, when I was studying these, uh, these uh, specific uh, yeah, topics about specifically how to make algorithms more efficient or even how to build your own shell. I remember mm -hmm. I had to do this project, this programming yeah. project of how to build your own shell. And it was very relevant for me because I could understand how uh, it works in a computer mm -hmm. and how actually we can build that stuff in terms of engineering. Mm -hmm. And same in terms of like how the algorithms work and why using a uh, no, uh, uh, tree uh, can be more efficient than using exactly. another algorithm and maybe uh, there's one approach that could solve a problem, but it may take days. And in a production yep. system, it may not work for you. Yep. So having that in mind, especially in a startup like ours, exactly. is very important because the resources are limited and time is limited. Yeah, many times we have a lot of data, the simplest algorithm, not only is the one that works really well, but also the only one that you can actually run on that data. It's actually when I moved to industry, that was a big thing. I thought it was going to be like all cutting edge stuff. And it's like, no, actually the simplest one is the one that that does the best. So. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it's what I was saying before is uh, finding the right amount of innovation together with knowing that you're building a product that users need to be working on, right? So it cannot yeah. be something that goes into 10 years because probably in 10 years things have changed so much yeah. that it's not even relevant. Yeah, yeah. Let's take the last question from uh, students. What is uh, an example of NLP performing a risk and security assessment? Ah, uh, great. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, when you're when you're doing and now, we actually have this this RSA conference right now in in San Francisco. So it's an interesting it's an interest po interesting point, and I think a field that is that is very relevant into the into the future. So. For example, when companies are doing a risk assessment uh, or security assessment, uh, there's a lot of documentation that they need to look at. And there's uh, private information, there's uh, risk of privacy problems, there's risk of security if you have like, uh, let's say banking data or whatever it is. So in terms of NLP, it will be kind of finding those uh, patterns in data without having to tag them, right? Because you can look for specific words, you can model them with rules, 
but how, if you have a huge amount of data, do you find, do you group that data-specific problems, data-specific topics, uh, so that they're e easy to tag and easy to build a model on, right? Yeah, definitely. Great. So let's uh, let's think about more about our students because our students are representative of us, right? There's there's variety in location, gender, nationality, age, uh, what knowledge you come in, and and that's one thing that's fascinating of, of AI, right? Like that everybody comes from a different walk of life. So in your experience, you come from a walk of life. Do you have any any words of encouragement you'd like to uh, to give our students to uh, about about? Yeah, I mean, life? I think uh, the good thing of, of AI, as we've been saying, is that you can apply your own experience into the field, uh, whereas it's in a vertical uh, specific like banking. If you mm -hmm. come from the financial industry, you're going to know first a lot of inefficiencies and problems of the financial industry mm -hmm. that can be solved by AI. Mm -hmm. And there you have an advantage because like yeah. most of the people that haven't worked in finance maybe don't know the specifics for that. Mm -hmm. And same if you come from the engineering or uh, you have a different background uh, as opposed to AI or like a product background, you're going to have a different mindset on how to solve those problems. So I think, uh, and, and that's also what we try when we build our team and thinking on the team in like the investors, and specific mm -hmm. people that are working on the team and even our clients. Mm -hmm. When we work with clients, like some of the feedback they give us on some of the use cases with unstructured data that we find we could solve, we may not be able to come up with them uh, without them telling us because there's day-to-day -day problems that they face. So for example, uh, when, when speaking with our clients, we found that uh, it would be very useful to apply our technology into um, employee feedback. So for mm -hmm. big companies, employees can give a lot of feedback, but it's challenging uh, on how like to find patterns on problems that you have in the organization. So it's a use case that we haven't thought of before, uh, but it could be inter an interesting application of our technology and opens up a whole new vertical, which is HR. Right. Right? right. So the more you know about different things, your original, maybe your original background was HR, you can apply it yeah. to to this case. And, and I think that's that's the point, like also if you're, especially if you're trying to build uh, a new product or you're trying to get into the industry, is combining the knowledge that you already have, your advantage against the rest of the people, mm -hmm. which is knowledge, and then the uh, specifics of what you've learned in AI and how they can solve that problem mm -hmm. that you know, and maybe a lot of people don't know. Great, yeah. Any final words you want to say to to our students? Um, no, I mean, uh, I think we're uh, uh, in a great era, in a great moment in terms of AI and innovation. Uh, there's like everything that is happening in AI, uh, a lot of what's happening in AI has happened in the last years. Yeah. Um, but I think there's still a lot of innovation to happen. So to anyone out there, I would say uh, don't think that everything is going to be built by Amazon, by Google, by Microsoft, because uh, like there's people out there that uh, have the intuition, that have the innovation uh, background that can lead them to find, to, to, to create, to build the next Amazon, right? So, so I wouldn't say like Jeff Bezos says that you're going to start a company that he's going to crush you. Uh, I believe that that's may not happen, so mm -hmm. that you can build a company with a, with a focus, even if it's deep tech, even if it, if it has a lot of research, and maybe build the next Amazon or, or build something that a lot of users can benefit from uh, and can use your technology to solve a real, a real life problem. Great. Yeah, and I want to reiterate on, on Horace's uh, statement. I think. Uh, I think artificial intelligence is, is something that we're all learning. We're all still building. You know? it's, not, it's not done, and it's, it's hard to know many things. And it's, uh, we feel ignorant. I mean, I think, I think everybody feels ignorant, including, including the experts. And uh, I think that's a good feeling. Like, I think if you feel ignorant, it means you're learning more. And as long as you're learning more and, and enjoying, you, you are part of, are part of, this, of this revolution. You know? Yeah, exactly. So. It's keep learning. Yeah. Uh, 
and that's that's the way we all that's grow we ourselves, right? Exactly. Well, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Jorge. Gracias. It's been thank a you. pleasure to have you here. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today, and see you in the next uh, Fireside Chat. Yeah, pleasure was, my, was mine. Thank you. Thank you.